Good evening, everybody. Well, evening at least here on the East Coast. Uh, welcome to the August edition of .NET DC. I am Sean Colleen, your host for the evening. It's great to have you with us. And I know that we're streaming now, so we can't necessarily see everyone's smiling faces in person, but we are very happy that you're here. I see we've already got about 20 people in, in, the, in the live stream, which is great. Uh, so just want to send you a reminder that we've got some polls that we're running throughout the evening. So if you're interested, uh, there's a map right there. We'd love to know where you're viewing. Uh, where you're viewing us from, where you're tuning in from. So feel free to head to uh, pollev.com slash SeanK431, my beautiful branded link there, and uh, give us a little bit of uh, information about where, where you're coming from. We'd love, to, we'd love to hear it. But of course, I'm here with Jeremy Miller. Jeremy, thanks so much for, for making the time to come out with us this evening. Really excited to hear you talk this evening. Hey, thank, thanks so much for inviting me yet, yet again. I'm, I'm very happy for this opportunity. Great. So, Jeremy, how is uh, how's the weather? Uh, you're in Texas, right? How's how how are things there? Is it is it brutally hot? Is it cooled down a little bit? Like I know it's been pretty intense there. We've we've had a couple of days lately where it's cooled off to 98, 99 during the day. Um, no, this summer the summer's been brutal. Um, we are we are ready for October. No, you know, actually, it's weird. I haven't actually ever been to Texas, so I'm surprised. Like, I, I you know, certainly no, no objections to going. But you know, do you get a drier, a drier heat down there, or is it, or is it more the humidity as well? It, it depends where you're at. Um, <clears throat> Houston's going to be about as humid as any any place on the planet. Um, <clears throat> west of West Texas will be arid. Uh, where where I'm at in Austin, it, it's more humid than you would think. Um, we're not, still not too crazy far from the coast, so it, it's uncomfortable. <laughs> gotcha. Uh, fair, fair enough. And DC will give you a run for your money on the humidity. I mean, we're basically a swamp, so it'll, uh, you know, the, the humidity here is just just intense all the time. Um, but you know, so uh, I did mention we have some polls, and just so you know, Jeremy, it looks like we got people tuning in from from all coasts of the U.S. We've got South America represented there. We've got some uh, an Australian, at least one Australian here. So nice. I'm really happy to see that .dot DC is becoming more of a global thing. Um, you know, we always liked meeting in DC, but I, I really appreciate being able to go. Uh, you know, go and make this accessible to as many people as possible. So, you know, I got to say, we got a lot of places coming from around the world. Jeremy, any places that you're trying to get to next in the world? Where, where were the any ex- destinations uh, for you? Well, so yeah, but this this one's selfish. So, my oldest oldest son, oldest child, is uh, leaving for his freshman year of college in the next couple of weeks, and um, fate, as fate has it, he's going to London for his fre- just for his freshman year so i'm looking for every possible way in dc london every possible european conference that will have have me just to get a <laughs> chance, to, chance to maybe make sure he's still alive could, could completely understood so you, there you go if you hear <laughs> folks you got your your london meetups your london conferences send them send them jeremy's way um and uh and you know maybe we'll, we'll crowdsource this for for your next you know the jeremy's year of london tours <laughs> Um, so that's great. So, you know, and I know we wanted to, I, I love, I love all the interaction we're getting. We got from, from Europe, we're only missing, I think we're only missing Africa at this point for, for attendees, which is, which is pretty good as far as continental coverage goes. Um, so, uh, what I'll do is I'm going to actually deactivate this poll because we did have a special question for the audience tonight and I'll throw up the next question. Uh, we wanted to know a little bit about, um, how familiar you are with event sourcing. And so I'll activate that poll. We'll just do a quick, you know, a quick one through five there. Not familiar at all. Very familiar, uh, just to kind of get uh, a sense of that. Let's see if I can share my screen here as well. Let's see if it'll let me. There we go. So we got that live poll coming back there. All right, so we have some folks who are familiar. Oh, this first of all, awesome! Thank you for for the the engaged poll voting. Sometimes I put a poll up and it just sits there for for a couple of minutes. So happy to see people responding pretty quickly. Thanks for that. Um, looks like a bunch of folks feel like they're pretty in the middle of the road, Jeremy, which I think is is probably a bit on par for for what you're looking to do tonight, which is that, that's encouraging. Okay. Okay. Good. Um, good, because I, I mean, I'd be the very best person to do an intro to to event sourcing, um, and, and I, that'll give me a chance to talk about why Martin is a little bit different than some of the other event stores. 
Great, excellent. And I will say for those of you who are interested in an introduction to event sourcing, or maybe you've got questions throughout the chat, feel free to put those questions in, in the chat there. We'll be monitoring the chat. You know, Jeremy will glance at it and I'll glance at it throughout. And if we see a question that's germane, we'll, we'll pop it up. And if it does get to one of those more introductory or conceptual questions, then uh, we can certainly bucket that. And I'm happy to work with you afterwards to follow up on that and connect you to other resources. So even if we don't get to everyone's questions this evening, just know that we will take a look at it and uh, we'll be happy to follow up on that. So I am, all right, this is good. This seems like a pretty good response rate based on our attendees. So I'm gonna go ahead there and, and cut this off. I'll stop my screen share there and we'll, we'll end that poll, uh, but, but good to know. All right, so then from there, what we'll do is we'll figure we'll, we'll do a quick intro. Um, we'll talk a little bit about .NET BC. We'll give everyone the standard rundown and then Jeremy will make sure we, we jump right into your talk. All right. All right. Sounds good. I'm sure that's what everyone else is waiting for as well. So .NET DC, August 22. Uh, we've got August 2022. We've got Jeremy Miller here with us. Very excited to have him. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about our sponsors. Thank them real quick. We've got Excella. Um, who's, you see me representing here with my polo. Actually, inadvertent choice for today, but it worked out fine. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar, Excella is a consulting firm in the D.C. area. We do modern software delivery, organizational transformation, advanced AI and analytics. So .NET and modern .NET is a, a, a big part, you know, is a part of what we do. And we do a lot of other really great things as well. So if you're interested in that kind of work or you need those kind of problems solved or you're just looking to, to join a great crew of people. We are uh, at least national at this point within the U.S. Um, so feel free to reach out to me about any and all of that, and we can we can go from there. Um, also, for a sponsorship, we want to thank Manning. Uh, Manning, uh, we have a 30% discount code with Manning. Uh, thank you to Manning for that. Um, so if you're interested in a Manning publication, you can use the user the group code UG367. Um, I checked a few months back, and it was still live, so we should be we should be good to go there. Um, and uh, and so feel free to you know use that and get yourself some some dollars off on Manning. Have to thank the .NET Foundation. Um, we they we are a sponsor of this meetup in, in a few different ways. Uh, first is that we have the uh, the .NET Foundation virtual user group. Uh, that virtual user group is uh, something that that is supported across all of the meetups. So if you uh, want to subscribe to the .NET virtual user group, you can go to that link there, a .NET virtual user group uh, at, at meetup, and you can uh, tune into the meetup events from all over the country, all over the world uh, that are of interest to .NET developers. So uh, we publish uh, every one of our meetups to that, and, and many other meetups do as well. I think I saw a good one from the Los Angeles meetup uh, that came out recently as well. So definitely give that a check. And we do want to thank the .NET Foundation for, for uh, sponsoring us and, and propping us up in that way. We, we really appreciate it. So uh, we normally, you know, we, we'd love to do this in person, and here's where we typically say announcements, and you all raise your hand, and, and we have a nice conversation. But since we're in streaming format, what I will ask is feel free to, uh, to mention coming events. Uh, or if you're hiring or looking to hire uh, or looking for a position, or if you've got you know, anything else that's on your mind, feel free to drop that in the chat um, and we can, we can potentially showcase that throughout. We also have an online site at github.com slash .NET DC. Um, we track all of our meetups and upcoming events there as GitHub issues. And we also have GitHub discussions where you can weigh in with topic requests or volunteer to speak. We still have slots open through the end of the year. So if you're interested in speaking, you've got some topics you want to talk about, feel free to, uh, to, to look me up. And uh, drop a you know drop a, an item in there for discussion. We'd love to to consider having you. Or if there's a topic that we have, or there's a strong theme, I'll go out and try and track down a speaker who can uh, who can come talk to you about. So definitely participate there and and, and let us know what you're thinking. But now for the main event, we've got Jeremy here with us this evening. Jeremy is the senior director of software architecture. Is it is it Mead Analytics, Meta Analytics, Jeremy? What is the what is the name Medi Analytics? Medi Analytics. Okay, great. Uh, you you may know Jeremy from his uh, greatest hits of, of many many .NET OSS projects, such as you know, Martin, which we're going to talk about tonight. He's also got Lamar, Jasper, Alba, Oakton. All of these are things you should look up because they're incredibly helpful. Uh, but we don't have enough time to go through them all. You also may have used Structure Map if you've been around for a bit. One of the first wonderful IOC solutions in the .NET space, um, and so that you know certainly I've used it uh, in my career. And Jeremy 
you saved me a lot of time uh, on that. So, th so thanks for that, Jeremy. I know it's not a not hugely uh, not you know actively developed anymore necessarily, but has been a great great boon for productivity for a lot of people. Um, and so, similarly, story uh, storyteller, a great automated uh, you know testing tool, um, and Fubu MVC as well. So, Jeremy, uh, thanks for all that you've done for the .NET open source community, and and we're really excited to talk to you today about uh, about uh, Martin in particular. <laughs> well, that, again, th thanks for having me, Sean, and um, I'm, I'm ready to take off. All right, sounds good. Well, you take it away. What I'll do is um, I'll disappear from the screen here. I'll monitor the chat, and I'll, I'll pop back on if, if we've got something to say. All right. Okay, folks, right. Uh, I'm going to try to be good and remember to look down at the camera instead of way up here. Uh, if you ever do an online talk, just always put your PowerPoint and your code on the screen where the camera is so you don't look weird. All right, uh, you've already heard all that. So let's start off. Let's pretend that we are, we're a team of software developers and we have been tasked with building a new telehealth uh, portal website application. Um, this isn't pulled out of nowhere. This is, this is uh, based on a project that I got to be a part of a couple of years ago. Uh, it was actually built on Node.js platform, but, but go with it. So you might remember there was, there was, and actually still is, this thing called COVID that, that kind of changed our lives for quite a while. And the idea of doing telehealth suddenly became very important. Um, just personally, I spent a lot of time on telehealth systems in the last couple of years trying to figure out if, you know, child sniffle was some, something more serious, right? But this is where we're going to start with. So thinking about, we've, everybody has probably used one of these by now. So think about some of the concepts that, that are in this. Um, you're trying to make an appointment, you're a patient, you're trying to get matched up with a, provi a healthcare provider that could be, a, could be a doctor, probably a nurse practitioner, a nurse, wh whatever it is. And, and we need to, to manage the scheduling of these online medical appointments, okay? So just keep this in mind. We're going to use this as our sample domain quite a bit. So event sourcing, let's start off. Uh, we'll get to CQRS in a minute, but let's talk about event sourcing in isolation first. It is primarily a style of system persistence where instead of trying to record the current state of the world, the system of record is actually an append-only log of the significant changes in state of the system. So if you think about uh, the applications where you've built some kind of audit log of the, this data was changed by somebody at this time, a little bit like that, except the events that we're gonna, we're gonna persist are gonna be um, in, expressed in the language of the actual business domain itself rather than just being, I, you know, these fields or this record was changed at this time by this user, okay? <clears throat> we'll make this a little bit clearer when we get into sample code in a second. Now, when will, might you look at event sourcing? What is it a possibility and what are some of the strengths? Um, one of the strong uh, advantages to event sourcing, if you have any interest in in domain-driven design, or you just like the idea of your, your code that expresses business logic, having some connectivity to the actual business language. Event sourcing is a very natural way to express the functionality of the system in the actual language of the business. It, it, it's a great technique to get us, the developers, on the same page with the business experts. So in the case of the telehealth, um, it is it is a healthcare system in, inside the U.S., so there are strong legal requirements for an audit log. Of you're going to need to satisfy at some point uh, that we have logged, you know, when providers are matched up, when appointments started, what what maybe what data was accessed, so on and so forth. Event sourcing gives you an audit log for free because it is effectively the the change log. Um, some people will treat these next two lines as separate things. One of the huge advantages of event sourcing, if you think about it, we're, we're, if we're capturing this appointment started in here, it, it was finished there, the provider finished his extra work, his or her extra work there, 
we can use those events and we can go back in time and we can say, what was going on at 10 a.m. yesterday? You know, as we talk about the telehealth system and, and you know that when this happens, like say, deployed for personal experience, you have a sick child, you're home with you, you really need to get them an appointment. That's my family dog. And, and, and you're really in a hurry to, to get something set up and you want a dependable time. But if your child is sick, something's going around, the, the doctor's office may be very busy. They may be running really far behind. Or the doctor's office themselves later want to know, hey, this day was terrible. What went wrong? Why did everything, what was the, the, the event that set everything off? So... <clears throat> One of the things we can do with event store, event log, that's really valuable is something called an idea, just time travel. Be able to say, replay the events and say, let me just advance the state of my office, you know, in like five minute increments and see what was the state of the world at 10 o'clock, 10.05, and try to figure out what went wrong. So that, that's a very similar problem to the first project I ever got to be involved with, with event sourcing. Uh, that was actually trying to optimize the function, functioning of um, surgical operating rooms. Okay. Uh, one of the things we're going to need, need with this telehealth system, you know, we talked about it, it's really valuable for, to be able to tell a potential patient, hey, we expect it to be to provider to be ready for you in 30 minutes. But how do you know that? How can you say that reliably? At some point in time, we're going to need really good metrics about how long are appointments normally taking, um, what time of day, how many how many providers are here. We're going to run this all through queuing um, queuing theory to figure out what the wait times are. But as we do this, we're probably going to need to occasionally tighten our algorithm for how we calculate that. One of the awesome things about event sourcing, if we are capturing the raw changes and change, also capturing when did this change take, take place, we can replay the events and we can retrofit metrics that we missed, we didn't know we needed. We can actually replay the, the events from maybe to the beginning of time, maybe not. But we can replay the events and we can get more information out of this change log than we could ever possibly have done with the one single database model that we no, normally use. I'm going to talk a little bit about CQRS in this talk, not not that much, but just know that it's so a command query responsibility segregation. It's an architectural style of keeping very strict, um, <clears throat> being very aware of when you are making writes through commands versus reading data through query. Usually it's going to go so far as to have separate database structures. Not necessarily a separate database, but separate database structures optimized for either writes or to reads. Event sourcing and CQRS, they tend to go together like peanut butter and jelly, or, or as, as Forrest Gump would say, peas and carrots. But the reality is both event sourcing and CQRS can be done independently of each other. So just, just make sure any, any purist folks watch this and complain about that. I'm going to have to try to prove this out, but there are some advantages with event sourcing and when you are in a system with a lot of concurrent access, um, it gives you a few more opportunities to handle that gracefully. And I'll try to prove that with the Martin and Jasper demos in just a second. Now, before we even get into technology, I still want to talk about some of the, the logical problem solving that we use for event sourcing. So there is a requirements workshop um, idea called event storming that, that's closely associated with event sourcing uh, that I happen to think is very effective. Um, I did get to do, the only time I have gotten to use event storming in, in a, you know, an official job capacity was actually building this telehealth system a couple of years ago. And we just happen to have very cooperative business partners, and I was really happy about how this went. So the process of event storming, um, if you're doing this in person, you're actually all going to walk into a room, which hopefully has a large empty board, empty wall, and you're going to have a whole bunch of color-coded stickies. 
which conveniently enough um, happen to reflect the most common variety packs you buy. Um, actually, look at the orange, the orange uh, little little squares here. So the first step is to try to talk about what are the logical steps in the business process where the state of the system changes. You know, where do we have a transition from we're in this status to that status? Um, if we start with telehealth, some of the, the events we might we might identify that you know a patient has requested an appointment. See that. <clears throat> Or an appointment has been, sometime at the system, the appointment has been scheduled. We have batched up a provider. We know when we can when we can say this, this appointment will be ready. Um, looking at the top right, you see the provider has joined the room. He's off, he or she is online and ready to work. So those are the orange, the orange boxes. Not necessarily a one-to-one -one relationship, again, for Paris. The blues... We can start now to identify once we do this first step of adding in the events, not to say that you can't go back and forth in what you're doing. The blue, now we're gonna say, what are the commands? What are the inputs to the system that may spawn these, these events? So just look at the top left. Uh, the event is point, appointment requested. So we want these to be terse. We want these to be named in terms of the business, business domain itself. And we want these to be expressed in past tense. On the other hand, the commands, they need to be in present tense. And, and again, this is just an idiom, but it's a very common idiom. So just, just follow it when you do this. The commands are some kind of imperative. Um, in my case, I, I'm saying there's one that's going to be request appointment. Okay. And from there, just some of the extra things I'm going to add. You see the little stick figures, if you're familiar with use cases, same thing. Just identify what kind of user roles are in the system, just like normal. And there, there's nothing super scientific here, but you kind of put them next to, you know, who who's spawning these commands. And lastly, this will matter in a little bit. The green, green squares down below, green is color coded for views that you're going to need of the system. So at some point, we're going to need to know not just all these goofy appointment requested, appointment scheduled events in this, this depend only row. At some point, we want to know, no, really, what is the current state of the appointment right now? We need all these things combined into a view of what is the appointment right now. So at a guess from having built, built one of these before, we're going to need a view for appointments. And this is also basically going to become our aggregates. The provider shift. So this is a provider, one day of work. And then a board. In this case, just, just a, a board is going to be a closely related group of, <clears throat> of appointments during a single day. So think of uh, pediatric appointments in Texas on August 16th. So there's a little bit of a routing of this provider as a pediatrician or a pediatric nurse. So we probably want them working with this board. The patient is looking for an appointment for a child. I think you all can obviously see how I have mostly used telehealth in the last several years. Uh, this appointment is, is for a child living in Texas. So we're going to route it to this board. All right, so we finally have Martin. Um, if you're not familiar with this, and I was not myself till we picked the name seven or eight years ago, but a Martin is a um, little mammal. Uh, they look, they are very closely related to weasels. Uh, if you want to go look, look at pictures of them, they're really cute. Um, but it is an open source library in .NET. I think we started this in, a uh, former colleague and I started this, I think in 2015. It was built specifically for something we needed at, at our then employer. Um, <clears throat> we had an idea that you could take Postgres, which had this really unusually strong support for JSON. Um, technically, if you're looking at Postgres, the, the key differentiator is Postgres has a type called JSON-B. That's a very efficient binary representation of a JSON document. 
but that functionality is what enabled us to go through a library on top of Postgres that allowed us to treat PostgreSQL as a document database. Except in this case, we have all the advantages of a document database, um, except because we're building on Postgres, it's also very well supported. There's tons of monitoring, uh, cloud hosting options everywhere. And most importantly, it's ACID compliance. We have a strong consistency model that you don't necessarily get in a lot of other existing document databases. That I'm going to make a big point of the strong consistency as we go along. At the same time, just for fun, um, I put a little nascent event sourcing feature kind of off to the side of, of Martin and its original release. It turned out that actually became popular. Uh, a lot of people adopted Martin specifically because of its event sourcing support. And over the last several years, that's probably the, the leading source of usage of Martin. And that's that's taken up an increasing amount of the Martin team's time. So the advantage here of Martin as an event store is it gives you the ability to do event sourcing and even CQRS in the box. One database engine will give you the event store. It will give you a great way to project the read only view models. And it comes with asynchronous projection support uh, completely in the box that can be added as a hosted .NET hosted service as part of Martin. Okay. All right, it's actually time to write to see some code. You're probably tired of PowerPoint. <clears throat> Let me see if I can get to it. Okay, first thing we got to do though is see this connection string. Um, we do need to have a Postgres database running. Hey, Jeremy, real quick, could you uh, zoom in a little bit on that text if you're able? Perfect. Thank you. About that big? Okay. Yeah, that's good. All right. So real quick, um, Postgres is a lot smaller. I, I know most of us are .NET developers here, I'm guessing. Uh, Postgres has a much, much smaller Docker image than SQL Server. So while you can certainly put Postgres on your machine all you want or use a central server, it's very handy to use Postgres, run Postgres and Docker for local development. And that's what I'm gonna do here. So this connection string you see there, that just refers to uh, a Docker image. Um, so I've got a little Docker Compose file. It, it's actually part of the GitHub, the GitHub repository with all the sample code. Uh, let's tag this somewhere. So I'm going to start a database from scratch right here. Now I'm trying to prove nothing in my sleeves. We are literally, we're starting from a blank database. Okay. Now I'm going to jump in and spin up Martin and just do a couple easy, quick things. So I've got just a small X, X unit harness here. Uh, first thing I want to do is I'm going to spin up a Martin document store. So this is the primary connection to, to a Postgres database using Martin. Um, in this case, I'm just saying I'm using all default stuff. I don't really need to do anything fancy. So I just need to tell it what's the connection string to the Postgres database. Okay. Behind the scenes, this is all NPG SQL. That's the ADO provider for Postgres. Um, just to make sure things run cleanly, uh, Martin has some built-in stuff for testing just to wipe out the state of a database between tests, if, if you want to do that. So that's what I'm doing here. And then finally, um, I'm going to do a little bit of reference data. So one of the strong things about Martin is it's a document database and an event store. So reference data, data that's very static, like information about the providers that work on the system or the patients that have registered, those can just be static documents, right? And we can even utilize those as part of the event store. So to start out, um, just to have this for later, um, I'm wiping the database. I'm going to very quickly just pop open a document session in Martin. Um, if you're an EF core user, this is like the DB context. It represents the unit of work for, for Martin. This will be scoped to a request mostly. Um, anyway, 
So we will create a little provider document just so you understand how the identity works here. There's not much to it right now. Um, a Martin convention, and there's ways to override this, but because it sees a member, public member called ID, it says, aha, that's the identifier for this document type. And because it's a GUID, I know what to do with it. It's going to use a sequential GUID behind the scenes. There's, there's some other options. So, you know, there's no magic. So I'm going to save the provider. I'm going to commit the transaction, save that off. Okay. Just to prove that we have a little bit of reference data. Now, this test is actually um, using the event store functionality. So <clears throat> I'll get into the terminology in just a second. But here we're going to model the beginning of a provider shift. So you're, say you're a nurse practitioner, you're starting the day, you've just logged in, um, you have this pick which, which appointment board you're going to be on for that day. And you've also said, I I'm ready, for, I'm ready to be matched up right now. Just fire away. So again, only talking about persistence. Uh, in this case, I'm just so you know, I'm explicitly telling it what Martin, what the, the, the identity is here, just to make it easier to, um, to run some subsequent tests. So that's all I'm doing here. Um, but I'm going to start a brand new event stream for this provider shift. And I'm going to register a couple events, provider joined and provider ready. Let's take just a little bit of a look at this real quick. So th this is a purposely a very simplistic example. You can certainly put a lot more data in these events. Um, if you happen to be on .NET 6 or above, uh, the new record type in C-sharp is very handy, um, just to have a very shorthand way of defining these little event classes. You can certainly use a normal class. Um, we also have quite a few F-sharp users, but this is what we've got. So a provider joined, this is starting out the provider shift. We're just, just collecting, hey, it is this, this provider. So this is just a reference to what person is this and what board are they joining today? Just simplifying this by saying a shift is a person on one board for a day. Okay, and then we can just save it. You know, running this test, I mean, this is just a smoke test right now, just to say nothing blows up. And we'll run this. <laughs> I know the text is really small, but... Coming over here to the results, um, I did put a logger in here, to, a verbose logger, just to show you there's stuff happening on the outside. So to try to go faster, Martin in development mode, it's dealing with a lot of the SQL for you behind the scenes of the database. It's smart enough to reach into the database and see, I expect these tables to exist or these functions to exist. Do they exist or do they exist differently? And I'm going to go ahead and create a database migration on the fly and apply it, get that up to speed, and then just let you work. The whole point here is, as a developer using Martin, we want you to be able to start a new app, add the Martin library, and just immediately go to work. We don't want you to have to fiddle with ORM mappings, um, have to worry about configuration, setting up all kinds of automation to build out your database. With Martin, a lot of that is baked in. Just get up and start working. Now, so this is just a pitting events. So some of the other big key concepts. At some point, you do need to see what is the state of the provider shift. Are they busy? Are they ready for new work? Are they here? Are they on break? So let's actually have a, what we call a projection inside of Martin for the provider shift. Okay, so if you were to programmatically just compile all of these events, say if you have 10 events for the day for the provider shift, just run them one at a time and update this provider shift document the way it should be to come up with the current state. Right now, what you're seeing is just, just the raw data elements that need to be there. And I'll talk about this version that it looks like it's not used in just a second. 
so <clears throat> there are ways to do this explicitly with, you can use lambdas and explicit lambdas all you want, but my preference for this kind of thing is to use Martin's naming conventions. So the key naming convention here is create or apply. Create tells us, tells Martin that if the provider joined it, event is encountered, we want to create a new provider shift uh, document when, when this is this is executed. So create can be a little bit fancier. We can actually take in a few extra arguments. That this is all none of this is is mandatory. But in this case, I want to enrich the provider shift. I want to go look up the name of the provider and have that be part of this projected provider shift. So you can see who is it. So that's all I'm doing right here is when this provider shift is first created from the first provider joined event that we go look up the provider, static provider data, and what's their name? And the starting position, you assume that it actually shouldn't be, that's actually wrong. Don't assume that, that the provider is necessarily ready just because they logged in, right? Now, these others, the apply, <clears throat> you see other events coming in and just little changes. If they mark, if we would counter a provider ready, that means the status should be ready. And it also means they're not currently in an appointment. Okay, okay. Now let's see this in usage. So this is the easiest possible way to use a projection in Martin by putting these methods directly on this guy right here. This is what we call a self-aggregate, just that it knows how to, to modify itself when it counters events. It's just, just an easy way of doing things. So the first usage, um, assuming that we have already run this test up here, uh, drum roll please, because I don't think I tested this super hard before we got here. Uh, there is a, um, ooh, shame, shame, shame. Oh, <laughs> sorry, folks. Uh, one second. <laughs> I think that may be the problem. Anyway, shame, shame, shame. <clears throat> okay, shame on me. I did something wrong. Um, I can fetch. <laughs> no, it, it, it's a, uh, it, it's too much last minute, last minute prep, um, and changing this this test harness at the very last minute, which I should not have. But anyway, <clears throat> functionality wise, if we know the the ID of the shift. What I can do is do what we call a live aggregation. Using this aggregate stream async, we are, Martin is actually fetching the raw events and playing them bang, 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 right through this provider shift, shift aggregate. So this method would be called, this method would be called, you would see the resulting state. Okay. So we're going to get a little fancier in just a minute. And let me see if I can make this work. And all right. So some of the terminology I threw out at you. So an event, I think this is a little more clear. It, it, it represents in business terms, a change in the system state. Now a stream, it's a related, closely related linear log of events. So in this case, the, the logical streams we would have a single stream for a single appointment. So that would, we'd be able to fetch the entire stream's worth of, of events to know when, when was it, when was it requested? Was it canceled? When did it start and finish? Okay. So a stream is, is probably gonna be related pretty closely with the idea of an aggregate. 
You're going to see this in every event sourcing documentation somewhere. But it's a read side view of a particular stream of events, which, which I might be a little bogus because just to confuse things, it is also possible to, to create an aggregate across streams, kind of like Ghostbusters, except it's safe to cross the streams. And then finally, a projection. This is the mechanism to project any array of events into a view document, an aggregated document. Okay. And that one, um, I'm going to just peek to see any questions before I go on. That, that's the basic terminology and one failing demo. I haven't seen any questions in the chat so far, Jeremy, that we haven't responded to. I've been posting some links along the way as you go, but nothing nothing so far. I'll, I'll interrupt you if we've got any. Okay. All right. So the options you have in, in, in Martin, we'll get to some of the things that are a little fancier. So <clears throat> you just saw we can create an aggregate for all the events in a single stream. I think that is the most commonly used um, use feature. I think that's going to exist in basically every every event sourcing app application you ever do. I could be wrong. Um, you can also create aggregates across streams. So in the case of telehealth, um, I'm not going to demo tonight, but it is possible to create an aggregate that is for a single board. For a single board, we want to see the current state of all of the appointments that are part of the board. Are they queued, scheduled, um, in progress? And maybe you want to keep a handful of most recently finished along the lines of the providers that are part of the board who is busy with a patient or busy with a, a process they call charting. that will come into play in a minute. It's just whatever note taking they need to do at the end of a meeting to finish off the appointment. Um, and we're going to use, we would need to use this board aggregate both from the perspective of at some point a user interface is going to need this for the people that are monitoring the system to know how are things going. But also at some point, we're going to need this kind of world view of the board to know who can we match, what providers can be matched with, what, what outstanding patients, and what kind of schedules. Okay, we've got a question um, here. We've got a question here, Jeremy. Um, a little bit, uh, which perhaps you may be getting to in a second, or you may want to answer now. In terms of the projection that you showed, was it calculated on read, or can you calculate or cache projections async when you write them? Yes, you can do. Uh, you can do every. Yes, you can do every possible um, scenario you just described. So, so we got two access two axes, you know, one, what scope of events does applies to this projection? Is it a single stream? Is it an aggregation across different events from different streams? Um, there's even some functionality to project event data to a flat table. So thinking of the case, um, I, I told you we're going to need to support Q theory to be able to predict how long it takes to to um, um, you're going to wait in queue. So one of the easiest ways to do is probably just create a very flat table that says this appointment started at this time, ended at this time, and then we can use that with raw SQL to group it, slice it, dice it, get means, get medians, use all that great stuff that, that SQL has. And we can even retrofit it later. So that's a possibility. Now, what Tim was asking about was really what we call the life cycle. So what I was showing you was, oh, come back here. What I was showing you was using a live projection. So I am building up the projection on the fly. So if you have a case where you have many writes and very rare reads, it may be valuable just to do a live, live aggregation when you need it, right? The other value of the live is it's going to give you the most current state. So there's a lot of, there's a little bit of FUD. Um, well, it's understandable FUD, but there's a little bit of FUD around event sourcing that it means that you're 
automatically have eventual consistency and you're going to have all kinds of problems when you've written data, but then the UI has old data because it hasn't caught up yet and it's going to confuse your users and everything's going to go, everything's going to go to hell, right? Um, and also that's happened to me before. So, <laughs> so Martin gives you a couple, a couple other options here. Uh, let me go back to code. And let's, let's look at a couple of those. So this provider shift, right now I'm doing it live. What we could do instead is say, I wanna do it what we call inline. Um, if, if you're an experienced person with event sourcing, you're used to other tools, you, you may sneer at this, that this isn't the way that real event sourcing people do it. Um, I don't care about that. Uh, just a little bit. Okay. Uh, now we do it a little bit differently. So ahead of time, I can register that. Hey, Martin, I want this provider shift to be updated in line. So if I do it this way, so going back to this test. And I'm not going to be silly and try to run it right now. Um, when I do this test and I run this test, when it hits session.save changes with this configuration of the store, um, <clears throat> at the same time that is persisting the events and in the same exact same same transaction, in this case, it's new, it'll create a new provider shift aggregate document. It will apply the events to it. It will calculate the updates. And it will save that as just a normal Martin document, all at the exact same time, same transaction. This gives you a strong consistency model so that the projected, um, the projected provider shift documents are always guaranteed to be in sync with the events that have been captured. A um, little bit differently if, let me just show this being a little bit different. And I'll just remember not to. Okay. Likewise, if we have a provider shift that's already going and I'm a pending event instead of creating, a pending an event to an existing stream instead of creating a new stream, um, when we call save changes, behind the scene, Martin is reaching out, grabbing the most current version of that provider shift. It's applying the new provider paused event on top of that aggregate and persisting it all at the same time, same transaction. Um, to be fancy, it's even able to batch up the SQL commands to Postgres. So it's one batched up SQL command. So you save on network round trips. Um, yeah, it turns out to be a massive uh, performance optimization. That's running in line. Then the last one. So the FUD comes around from, oh my goodness, you have to do it with eventual consistency, which sometimes can be extremely problematic for the reasons I just discussed but also can sometimes be highly advantageous. Um, just talking about a project that I'm actually helping with at my own work right now, Meta Analytics. Um, we have a case where changes to our system um, cause a dynamically generated query to need to be updated. This dynamically generated query is unusually complicated um, and very slow uh, because it is so complicated and over such a large data set. So what happens today is when users need to go see what's the current state of this, this query, we have to make users wait while this big, long, hairy query runs. And, you know, it's just spinner's going to be up on the UI for a long time. This query doesn't change very often. What we could do instead, and what we were actually going to pursue, is introducing a little bit of eventual consistency so that when the configuration for this dynamic query set is changed, we'll go ahead in the background process, start spinning up, start running this, this query, and save the values, save the results to a document. I don't think this will be Martin, but it could be. Let's pretend. Um, that's saved, 
like a materialized view, if you're familiar with that concept. So that when a user comes in and says, I want to see the most current query set, it's fast because it's already pre-calculated. So what we want to do with eventual consistency is on the right side as updates are coming in, bang, 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 bang. And there's maybe an expensive um, operation to update the model. Instead, we could just capture the event that's pretty fast. And then in the background, do the expensive work off to the side in, in a background process. So we're not hammering this web service that may be taking in requests from the outside. So we're fast as far as our outside users can tell because we just move the slow part to somewhere where it doesn't impact the users. That's on the right side. In, in this case, I'm talking about on the read side, it would be hugely advantage, advantageous for us if that data was built up ahead of time instead of having to be calculated live. So stepping back to the code for just a second. Um, to do this, I actually need to switch. Now I need to show you uh, um, an actual application a little bit. So let me shut all this down. So small application, don't worry, I'm gonna add this in. Okay, so in this case, same application, well, the actual application. Um, hopefully you're all familiar with web application, create builder, the new web application model, because it's not a new .NET version unless they completely change how we use host builder, right? So if you've been using .NET 6 a little bit, this is all commonplace. Um, if you're not, this is the same host builder stuff, it's just presented in a completely different way. So we have an extension method called add Martin uh, off of service collection. So this is where you're going to register a Martin document store, the iDocument session, the iQuery session. Just gives you a fast recipe that's very idiomatic to more recent .NET. It's for you to add Martin to an existing .NET application. Sweet. So same thing you saw before. I am registering... Here, I'm registering provider shift in line. Let's do what you were asking. Could this be done with eventual consistency and run this in a background thread so that you have provider shift mostly up to date, but it happens in a background thread so you're not hammering on your web service necessarily. Now, I do need to add just a little bit more here. <laughs> there are some um, you know, imperfections. So now with this configuration here, with these two lines of changes, I'm saying I want provider shift to be calculated asynchronously. Do it in the background. We're going to take advantage of eventual consistency. But then I need to add, there's a subsystem in Martin that's called the asynchronous daemon that is adding a hosted service. It's a .NET core, core concept. Uh, to run this in the background, to be constantly scanning and pulling new events coming into the Martin database and updating these projections as they go. Um, just happened to see the, the question. Um, yes, lots of people are using Martin with more than one strongly consistent projection. Um, since it is fine grained, you can mix and match um, strong, you know, the inline async and even, even live um, as much as you need to. Okay. Um, and, and we have people people do that that as well. Okay. So this daemon here, um, this is going to become a lot fancier in the near future. But for right now, uh, it can only run on one one node at a time. So we have some built-in leader election. That's that's what I've done here to run in hot cold mode. So it's only going to run on one, one node at a time, um, but it'll make sure that it doesn't run on multiple nodes. So that's kind of important. So. All right. So those are the options for projections. What is different about Martin is having actual option, options for the strong consistency. 
the inline life cycle I, we think is unique to Martin, but I'm sure somebody else out there doesn't. I just don't know of. Okay. So time travel, it's just your ability to go back and see how was it, what did an aggregate look like at a different time? Um, super valuable for troubleshooting or, or just kind of understanding what the world looks like or visualizing what happened. So just going back, um, it's actually done through the same mechanism as our live streaming. This case, um, there's a couple, there's a lot more options here. Um, I can say that I want to look at what did the provider shift? What were they doing at I mean, obviously, this is kind of nonsensical, but what were they doing three hours ago? And what this will do is it will, uh, in memory, it'll load all the events for the stream um, up to this timestamp that I've specified here, and then it'll calculate the provider shift on the fly. So this is a way of seeing what, what was the provider shift doing at any time during this day? Day. Hmm. All right. So I mentioned that it, it's legal to um, to replay or rebuild projections or just replay the events. Maybe you add a new projection later. Uh, like I mentioned, the the example of maybe we want to create some kind of new metrics. Maybe the way we were calculating existing metrics were all wrong, or we discovered something new. Um, somebody brought up the case today that there's a new legal requirement. Whatever the case may be, you actually need to change your projections and the way that they handle events, um, and then go update the state of the system. Now, what's important here is the, the the events themselves. That is the system of record. The projections, the projected views. It's a reflection of the events. So we can just go replay them. Uh, easiest way to do that in Martin, it's actually a command line. Um, see how this goes. Um, <laughs> So there, there's basically no events in here. This should be ridiculously fast. Yep. Oh, well, okay. <laughs> it's really fast because there's no events. But the point is, there, there's a command line here that will tell you. They'll give you uh, options to do it this way. Okay, so running this in a, in uh, interactive mode, so I can even pick out. In this case, I can even say I just want to I just want to rebuild the appointment projection. That's change. So what this is doing functionality wise, this is actually wiping out any documents created by this appointment projection, and it is starting starting it over and using asynchronous daemon to as quickly as possible play all the way through the events all the way to the end and update this appointment projection. Um, obviously there's some complexity there. Can you do this? You can't do this while the system's necessarily functioning today. Um, there's another, another concept of events being archived where you can kind of shove some things off the side, but just know you have the ability in Martin out of the box as part of a deployment to rebuild, rebuild the projections. What I'm showing here, this is extremely helpful when you're in development time. You're probably constantly um, revving and iterating on how your projections work. Um, and this also gives you the ability to just retrofit a new projected view to your system. Um, Sean, how about, about 15 more minutes? Oh, you're you're all good. Take your time. We're we're all we're all here for it. Okay. Um, so, 
<clears throat> when people are kind of afraid of event sourcing, you know, they think it's not so much it's more work or less work than using the one central database. It's just the work happens in different places. So one of the values of event sourcing is the data, the exact view that you need for a client, you can persist exactly that. So at runtime, when the client says, I need to access what this board looks like or this provider looks like, you can have it pre-built, which allows us to do this. And this is this is going to be something that's unique to Martin. Uh, using a controller method here, uh, if you access, if you request, what is <clears throat> what is the current state of this shift? Um, this is only going to work, of course, if you're using inline or asynchronous projections. Um, but what's happening here? This is the Martin facility. It is shooting this. It is pulling out the JSON directly from the database, which hopefully you've got the JSON formatting just the way you want it for the UI. Um, you're not bothering. You are not deserializing the data. You are not even creating a, a, a JSON string. You're pulling the raw JSON straight out of the database and streaming it byte by byte right to the HTTP response. And it's also dealing with HTTP content link, content type, all that good stuff. That's it. This is this is the entire uh, web service method. Um, I mean, it's middleware doing authorization and junk like that for you off the side. Um, this is going to be the absolute fastest way to provide data through a web service. Compare this to a model where you have the one database. Maybe you're using just to pick on Entity Framework Core. If you're using if core. Um, when you pick out the provider shift, maybe you need to go get a couple different entities at a time. So you have to worry about all the, what do I include? What do you not include? Um, EF Core has to parse the SQL statement. It has to translate that to SQL and go grab all this data, build up this, this domain object. I'm, I'm being sarcastic here, folks, on purpose. Uh, then you're going to use something like AutoMapper because, you know, you need to translate it to a DTO structure that doesn't strongly couple your client to your personal domain objects. So now you have all this auto mapper stuff that's spitting this up and it's building all these different objects from these other objects. And then finally it serializes that to JSON and shoots it down the HTTP response. Point here is, but that whole diatribe of all these things that are happening in a normal non-event source kind of system, that's a ton of overhead folks um, compared to what's happening here on the screen where we're just shooting a byte array down. So there you go. That's This is one of the advantages of, of doing event sourcing and having your client views pre-built and pre-baked for you. All right. Okay. I, I feel like for Streamy, I'm just going to say, I feel like Streamy doesn't appropriately capture the, the impressiveness of that. So I just wanted to quickly you know, give, a, give a round of applause there because you're not able to see a bunch of people going, huh, that's pretty neat. But I got to say, I was watching it and I thought, ah, it's pretty great that you can just, with very, very little ceremony, pull down that much information that quickly in a pre baked way. So um, very, very nice work on that. Thank you. That, that was the lesson. We do it a little bit differently. That's the lessons learned from Ruby on Rails. Um, I, I think it's probably been a decade, but there was a story at one point of how what a massive performance improvement they made by having an option to stream data out of Active Record straight to the HP response without going through serialization, deserialization. So oh, and I, and I, I can't I take all the credit for that. I apologize. I also missed another question from Tim, and I'm sorry if you've answered it, and I missed that as well, about versioning projections to rebuild a subsequent version. Uh, I might ask you to go to the, the Martin Gitter room. I'm probably going to have to do a little back and forth to, to understand exactly what you mean. Okay. Oh, 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 I'm sorry, Tim. Um, yeah. Duh, I'm sorry. Uh, not thinking on my feet. Tonight. So, because that's that's an obvious thing to do. Yeah. So, 
Hey, Martin, go tell me what is what was version five of the provider shift? Awesome. Thanks. Hopefully that's what you meant. Hopefully that's what you meant. All right. CQRS architecture. It's very closely associated with event sourcing, even though it's something separate. But they go together so often, I am not going to yell at you if you conflate the two things. So they said it's an architecture that explicitly models the writes, the changes in system state, and separates these from the reads, what the places where a client needs to get system state out the way they need it. Okay, so years ago, I sat, on, sat in, uh, I think, uh, at a conference in 2008, I sat in a talk from Greg Young, who's the inventor of CQRS. Um, it, and he didn't even have the name yet. It was called something else at the time. And describing what he was proposing and how he was doing things. And I walked out of that thinking, this is insane because there's so much extra work, right? This is so much extra complexity. And if you go read CQRS tutorials, you're going to see some kind of diagram, you know, I kind of think of it as the scary CQRS architecture diagram of with all this extra infrastructure and we automatically have a separate database to hold the rights. What does that make sense? And, and then we have a separate database that's the query database that's optimized for reads. So optimized for what does the client need? If the client's looking for this data, it's already packaged up something different. Now, some people have, there's some valid reasons to do this, you know, that maybe this is a relational database that's very good at transactions, or maybe DynamoDB, something that's very optimized for reads. And then maybe this query database is Elasticsearch. Um, I've always thought Elasticsearch was really hard to use, but other people seem to like it and make it work. You see the point here. Um, but all this extra baggage, there's going to be some kind of command handler service that's separate from the query handlers, gives you data. And then there's probably some kind of background processing that's moving data somehow from the rights database to the query database. And anyway, I personally, I think this looks intimidating. So where Martin comes into play, a little help from Jasper in a minute is Martin lets you collapse this down to potentially to a single service using that asynchronous daemon to handle the background processing of raw events being captured to the fancier view models. Um, using the one database, Martin being able to append events, but also being able to persist documents at, at, at will. And document here really just our word, way of saying an entity. Um, the selection collapse, this is your topology doing CQRS with Martin, potentially. You may not necessarily want to have only one database, but this is a real easy way to get up and going. So now talking about what it would be like to create a command handler with Martin, your application. So take me in. Um, this time I want to use the concept of completing charting. So as so I described before, you are you're a provider. Say you're, you're a physician, you've just finished an appointment, the, the, the patient has logged off. Now you get a little extra work, you need to update some systems, maybe you need to write out prescriptions, write out recommendations. There, there's some paperwork you need to finish to close out the appointment. Uh, that's charting. Then at the end of it, you need to mark just the system. That's it, I'm done. We need it for metrics collection just to understand how long things take. And it's also going to mark mark the provider as probably as provider paused. We're going to explicitly make you say, "I'm ready for ready for the next thing." So that it's just automatic that you know, step away from your desk, walk around, go do something else for a minute until you explicitly tell us. So inside of that command, just talking about the logical steps. Um, Within a single command, I, I, I do need to say that it's not necessarily a one-to-one -one relationship between one command spawns zero or one events. It's a command could spawn multiple events. Um, so potentially you need to have a transactional boundary where the every event that's being raised at one time is being captured in one single transaction. 
Uh, to be able to complete charting, the simplest thing, most simplistic thing we need to do is we need to say that the provider was already in a state of, of doing charting, you know, to make sure that if there's heavy concurrency, we aren't erroneously updating multiple times somehow. And of course, there is concurrency happening. You know, maybe somebody's just pounding on on a button too many times and accidentally sending the same same message a bunch of times. Maybe multiple people are trying to help a, a provider out by trying to log them out the side. Who knows why? It, but it's it's absolutely possible and feasible that multiple commands are coming in from the same provider at the same time. We need to ensure that a, a provider, a command that's maybe issued against a, a, an expected version of this provider shift is the same. Then this is a little more, a little more advanced. We definitely need to make sure the events get persistent. And I'll get to this if we have time. Maybe you want to publish some outgoing events. Like if a provider is ready, we may want to trigger another background process to say, hey, this provider's ready for something else, start the assignment logic that'll match them up with a with an outstanding appointment. So let's move back to code. So I wanna show a couple different versions. Yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna look at three versions total. This is relatively new functionality in Martin uh, that somebody hasn't, documented very well yet on the Martin website. So if you're if you're a longtime Martin user, this this may actually be be new. So first thing I need to do is I need to go fetch the latest version. Um, and this fetch for writing, if it's live, if it's an inline projection, it doesn't really matter. This fetch for writing API, it kind of wallpapers over it for you. It's the same usage no matter what. So it just knows up front, is this provider shift, is this registered as, as inline or live? And it, it works a little differently behind the scenes, but who cares? It's the same thing logically. In this case, the complete charting command, this is my first, first command, and then I just need Martin a little bit to do this, showing you what it has. So it has the shift ID, uh, it's not actually using that anymore. And it also brings the version with it. So this version is coming from the client. This is the version of the provider shift, the revision of the provider shift that the client thinks that it was at when it issued this command to begin with. So in this usage, I'm opting into optimistic concurrency. So when I say fetch for writing, um, I want this, this provider shift by this ID, and this is what version I think this should be at, so, such that if somebody has snuck in and updated the provider shift since the client did its work, this will actually fail with a concurrency exception and stop everything. Uh, will not go any farther. Um, I can also do this couple other options for concurrency. If I don't provide the version, it will record the current version right at this time. And then you do whatever business logic you have to do to determine what events should be captured. And at the point of trying to save the changes, if by some way, again, optimistic concurrency, if somebody has somehow managed to come in and update this provider shift between fetching it here and saving it, this will actually throw a concurrency exception. That might actually be that might actually be helpful as well. Um, the analogy I kind of kind of use here is um, so I'm actually a New Year's baby. I was born at 12:36 a.m. Uh, January 1st, 1974. Woohoo! Um, but I was the second child born that year in the hospital. So. At the time, there was like this contest that the first baby of the year, their parents won a washer and dryer. And my parents really wanted to win that washer and dryer. And they were so excited. It looked like it was going to happen. And some other family came in, bang, had a child just like that at 1202 and, and 
beat my parents to the punch. And this is my analogy for optimistic concurrency happening in this usage. Now, why do I bring that up? It's because my parents and my grandparents have told me that story so many times over the years. So this is one usage, this new fetch for writing. This is handling both concurrency, uh, concurrency protection, setting us up, fetching the data we need, just helping us get things done. There is um, uh, okay. one more option, concurrency protection. Instead of using optimistic concurrency, um, we're on top of Postgres, which is a full-fledged database. So we could use row locking. So we can actually say, um, go a little more, more um, pessimistic and say, I will not continue until I can achieve an exclusive writer lock on that particular stream, this particular provider shift. And then I'll do my work and that lock will get released as you call safe changes. So there's some advantages to being on top of a real database. This is unusual for an event store. Okay. What you haven't seen me do, I haven't talked about shooting out any of the charting finished uh, event or, or whatever it is. So let's move on to the next thing. Um, so now I finally get to introduce Jasper. So Jasper was originally built. It's actually much older than Martin, but it's kind of languished for years um, because Martin takes up all my time. Um, but we're rebuilding it now in a version two as almost a complement to Martin to add a lot of CQRS um, ease of use on top of Martin with Jasper. So Jasper plus Martin, if we say Martin is event sourcing in a box, Jasper plus Martin, we're trying to give you CQRS in a box. Um, now this picture up here, just for fun. Um, my wife took this picture like seven or eight years ago on a family vacation. Um, if you can just barely see some stands over to the right, there's a little football field there. Um, so that's, 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 where, that's where my grandfather would have played football. My dad played football. I played junior high football. That, that's our hometown. Uh, so now let's go back and look at that same command handler. We'll just introduce Jasper. So maybe compare Jasper a little bit to... It is definitely aiming to compete with a mass transit or an in-service bus. Or if you want to use a sledgehammer to crack a walnut, you could also compare it to Mediator. Um, so this same little bit of functionality, now I want to do the same thing, but use Jasper. I'm sorry. Okay, so I have a slightly different project. Just showing you a little more of well, I'm sorry. Let me look at the handler first. So doing that same bit of functionality, maybe let me show these side by side. So this bit of functionality. Oh, and I should have said, uh, if you are comfortable with continuous continuation passing style, there is another alternative with Martin. Uh, called the right to aggregate uh, that'll let you kind of pass like an, uh, a lambda inside of it. And this is functionally similar to what you see here. Um, I think it's kind of half a six of one, half a dozen of another. But now compare this code on the left now to the code on the right. This is actually completely functional. <clears throat> Um, this is actually a superset of what you see before. So let's talk a little bit about Jasper conventions. So Jasper can automatically find the message handlers for inside your system. Again, it, it compare this to mass transit or in service bus, if you're familiar with those tools, or uh, the mediator handlers, or I guess brighter, brighter is another comparison. Um, Jasper doesn't require uh, you to implement Jasper interfaces necessarily. Just suffix a public class by handler. It can even be a static. Um, and then a method called handle or consume. And it always assumes that the first argument is the message type. Everything else is optional. I can even pull in, um, I can do method injection and pull in services that are in my IOC container. 
Um, I can pull in some other Jasper pieces. So it's it's a different animal than than the systems that require you to do an interface. Too much of that. <clears throat> this Martin command workflow, and maybe we should, we figure a way to do this differently. But for right now, this is telling Jasper I want to use using Jasper's Martin Martin middleware. I want to go wrap uh, that same kind of event workflow around this, such that um, with some conventions from the complete charting event, I am able through convention, I know that this thing called provider shift ID, Jasper knows by default that that refers to a provider shift document, an aggregate, because that's the second, second argument. So this Jasper will wrap this with, with middleware such that when complete charting comes in um, through a queue, whether it's RabbitMQ, who knows what else, uh, it knows how to go look up the corresponding provider shift for you, just using that Martin fetch for aggregate. So um, the same kind of validation we did before, you know, if it's in the wrong status, throw an exception. And then here, I can just return whatever events are being raised. The sample again is one to one, one command, one event, but Jasper already supports uh, one command returning zero to many, many events. So this is the exact same functionality. This is handling the Martin, the Martin um, transaction for you. It's doing a lot of lookup for you. So this is an example in event sourcing world of the decider pattern. So what we have is a function that only has to decide that given the current state of the aggregate and an incoming command, what events should be raised to create, um, create the, the change in state here. Okay. It's not, let me flip back and forth. There's the, the first round of code. Here's the second. Let me connect just a few more pieces. Um, in the application bootstrapping, I did take a little more work. I've added use, using Jasper against the host builder. Now, something I did not do, um, let me show you a few more things here. One thing we did not do with the pure MVC model is there are transient errors. You know, it, here we go. It's an imperfect world, and sometimes you have connectivity errors to the database. It's smart to do some retries. So with Jasper, just like you do with existing service bus tools, I can define some policies at an exception level, exception, exception by exception type, and really as fine-grained as I want to to say, in this case, let's do a little bit of an exponential back off. Let's, let's stop for a second, retry it in 50 milliseconds. If that fails again, try again in 100, 250 milliseconds. Or depending on what kind of concurrency you have, it may be valuable value to say, if I get, this is a Martin concurrency exception. Oh, you know what? Just go ahead and retry it. Let it calculate all over again from the current state. That That's actually okay, all right? This kind of thing is necessary to do this, this reliably and have that really robustness in a world where you need to expect transient failures. Uh, Tim, I'll, I'll get to the middleware question in just a second. A um, couple other things. Now, I'm also saying I'm registering a subscription here that we want to process the charting you've finished event. That will actually spawn, I don't know if you'd really do this or not, but I can say that for a particular event that's captured, I can actually use that as an input to some other action asynchronously off the side. That Jasper, when you are helping Martin persist a charting finished event, I want you to forward that, in this case, to a local queue. And when you do that, because it's a local queue, um, I want this queue to use an inbox. Um, let me talk about that next. So next thing I want to introduce is the outbox pattern and subscriptions. If we say we want this charting finished to be broadcast out to the world, um, the example there, I used a local queue, but maybe I used RabbitMQ instead. So now we're gonna introduce the outbox pattern, which nicely enough 
is supported by Jasper and Martin. So coming back to the existing Ad Martin that we saw before, now uh, with the Jasper persistence Martin Nougat, got a little more helpers. Um, I'm going to enroll Martin into the Jasper Outbox. Come back and explain that. And I'm also going to say I want to enable event forwarding to Jasper so that any events that Jasper is, has a subscription for, I want you to automatically forward those through Jasper's messaging once the transaction is completed. So knowing these things are in there. So if we want this to be a message that's sent back out after the database is captured, to be consistent, to make sure that the world is consistent, we need the database persistence of the events and this messaging, getting this message, getting to the message transport. We need it to happen, both happen or both fail. They cannot, you cannot get into a consistent state if one succeeds, but the other fails. That's problem number one. Problem number two is that this outgoing message absolutely cannot be sent until the events are captured. Otherwise, and some of my colleagues can attest to this, you'll get race conditions, you'll get really weird um, production bugs that are very hard to unravel when you get these kind of race conditions where the message leaks out before the database work that should have been captured first gets complete. So the Martin Outbox pattern, this is a way to get this consistency. So rather than using a two-phase commit, which never really works for anybody, right? Or it didn't back in the comp plus days. Uh, so instead, the Jasper the Outbox model, when I'm using with Martin, when we're capturing events, it is routing where the message should go you know, it should go to this RabbitMQ queue, it should go to this local queue, it should go to Pulsar, whatever it is, right? Um, instead of sending it out right at that time, what it does is it actually persists the outgoing message along with the route of where it's supposed to go. It persists that into a Postgres table and it captures that at the same time as the event in the same database transaction. Okay. If it succeeds, um, if it succeeds, there's a background process. It will release to Jasper that, hey, this message needs to go out. Jasper's outbox will do the work of making sure that it gets picked up and sent out. Even if the application manages to die between saving, making the database change, saves, and the message actually hitting RabbitMQ. Um, so... Freak, freak thing, lightning hits, maybe lightning hits your server room, you're still safe. As long as you bring the system up, it will be able to recover the outgoing messages, send them out. Okay. This is the outbox. It's really important for consistency when you're both making database changes and sending outgoing messages at the same time. It helps you control the ordering of what gets done. Um, and it helps you get to a state where Either you're all succeeding or all failing, so you're never in a halfway invalid state. Okay. Um, to Tim's question, he was asking, you know, what, what's the performance impact of Jasper's middleware? Jasper's a very, very different animal than, than these other apps. Um, if we have any in-service bus users, you're familiar with, maybe familiar with in-services bus concept of a behavior. Uh, that's actually taken from Jasper's forebear, Fubu MVC. Just this idea of the Russian doll model of middleware wraps around the outside of the inner handler, so it gets to do things on the beginning and after. Um, in service dust does it by compiling expressions to lambdas to funks to make it fast enough, and that's great. That's awesome. What Jasper does is it is actually Tim it does not have a performance impact uh, necessarily because what Jasper is doing is actually generating code at runtime, trying to generate the tightest possible code it can and compiling that at runtime or deployment or build time. Um, and that dynamic code is built to be as um, performant as we can possibly make it. So there's no reflection happening here. It's just baked in. Um, it even goes a little bit farther. This is getting into the weeds. The other difference is 
Um, Jasper, if it can, and it can't always, but if it can, it will actually eliminate the IOC from this whole process such that um, it will generate the code to call constructor functions to build up the dependency tree and pass that into the arguments here. Like this, like it actually knows how to build a document session. So the fastest IOC tool is no IOC tool. So it's a little special sauce with Jasper. That's that's tangent. I probably shouldn't have taken you down. Quick question to follow up with. Quick, quick question to follow up on that, Jeremy. You know, you're. I think you're. Uh, cer it's certainly reasonable for you to be. Uh, uh, biased in this regard, but just out of curiosity, is there a scenario in which Jasper wouldn't be a good fit to use with Martin, or or when would you suggest that someone maybe look at other options besides Jasper in this case? Well, just from the standpoint of it's newer, I mean, they're they're going to be a, there's going to be it's newer. We're we're supporting a subset so far of what in service bus or mass transit can be. I mean, in service bus is like 15, 20 years old. You know, yeah, they get a little, little bit of a head start on you. Uh, mass Transit started in Mass Transit started at the All.net conference in 2007 at uh, Sports Bar in Austin. So it's you know it's 15 years old. Um, I mean that that's that's the real simple answer there. And there's a lot of transports we haven't supported yet. You know we use RabbitMQ at work. Um, I'm mostly concerned about what we need to use Jasper at work. So that takes priority over Azure Service Bus or SQS or anything else. Fair enough. Well, I'm looking up, I'm scrolling up. I don't see questions in the chat that you haven't answered already. So we'll give it a few minutes or a few, uh, you know, a minute here for folks to add any additional questions you've got in the chat. Um, and while we do that, any any last parting thoughts, Jeremy? Anything that you were uh, that you want to make sure we walk away with knowing today? You know what what I what I hope hope have proven. Um, Martin gives you an option to do event sourcing in the box. It, it is going to be a fast way to get up and going, building grown up systems with event sourcing without having to set up a lot of different stuff to get going. Um, hopefully, hopefully this proves out that we've got a good ramp up time, a good startup time. Um, potentially, you know, hoping longer term, Jasper kind of adds that same kind of ability to get up and going in a in a full CQRS architecture. Great, and I, and I can speak just to the you know to the ability to get up and running with with Martin. I know we were talking about this a little bit before we went live on air, uh, but you know I I'm someone who's who's recently come into a lot of the benefits of event sourcing and really just kind of had some aha moments about where it could be incredibly useful and, and helpful. Uh, and you know one of the constraints I have in, in a current environment where I'm attempting to do event sourcing is I'm restricted to SQL Server. I'm not allowed to use you know, uh, Postgres, and so one of the the challenges I've had is you know working with different libraries. That, that allow um, allow you know the event replay and, and doing similar you know items with with a SQL Server backing. Um, I really started to miss some of the stuff that I've been playing around with with Martin, which was I, I found it was very productive. I was, it was quick for me to, as you mentioned, spin up a container and get running. Whether that's writing unit tests or whether you know really building out some application code and watching you know having that process of I think you've been using the term a lot lately around low ceremony, and I really enjoy that that concept of really low ceremony, low overhead, you know, once you sort of have an understanding or a grasp of the core concepts, you can be incredibly productive with Martin really quickly. And so I, I definitely, I, I tend to miss it on a daily basis whenever something uh, I'm attempting to do is more complicated than it needs to be. Um, but I think it's an incredibly productive library and I, I think you're really onto something great with it. Well, I, I really appreciate you saying that. Um, you know, can't help you with the uh, corporate policies the, the SQL Server corporate policies, but I, I really appreciate you saying. That. Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, we don't have any uh, we don't have any uh, additional questions in the chat. So I think for now, what we can probably do is you know we'll we'll leave it there for the evening. But I want to say, you know, Jeremy, thank you so much for for coming out and speaking with us and uh, taking the time tonight. I'm I'm glad that a bunch of folks hung on until the end. And this, as we mentioned earlier at the start, will be recorded uh, on YouTube for for you to browse and look at that, Jeremy. We made it through without anything getting cut off. Only minor minor dog yappage. So I think we're we're I, we can call that a win for the evening. I'll take it. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for, for, for being here tonight. And thank you, Sean.
Great. Thanks, everybody. And, and we'll see you for the, uh, for the September edition of .NET BC coming up soon. Uh, talks to be announced. So if you're interested in speaking or you've got a topic you want to hear, let me know and we'll be, we'll be going from there. But a huge thanks to, to Jeremy for coming out tonight. And, uh, and we look forward to seeing you at future .NET events. So, so stay tuned. Have a great evening, everybody. And, and we hope you're doing well wherever you are.